Okay, sounds good. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to our February Science on Tap event. Um, so the Science Policy Society here, um, we kind of focus on three main areas. And so that's education, outreach, and advocacy. Um, and so Science on Tap kind of falls under that outreach component of our mission um, in terms of like engaging with the public um, on scientific topics and kind of like a more general context. Um, so normally we would do these in person, but um, until we're able to safely be out in person, things are over Zoom. Um, so this, this month's event, we're talking about all things craft chocolate. And so we have some really great speakers here today. So we have uh, Dr. Allison Brown, who um, has a degree from Penn State um, in food science and international agriculture and development. Um, and then we also have Alejandro Gill, um, who is a PhD candidate here at Penn State um, in education development and community engagement. Um, so yeah, so the format here, they're gonna talk about um, some of their research focuses related to this industry. Um, and then we'll open it up for some questions and to kind of discuss some things at the end. Um, so I will turn it over to you guys and let you guys share your screen here. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. How is that? Great. Okay, awesome. And um, I can just say a couple of words, Alejandro, and then turn it over to you if that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Go ahead. So hello everyone, and thank you so much for attending um, Science Policy Society's um, Science on Tap. I'm Allison Brown, as Claire said, and I'm here with Alejandro um, Gil Aguilera. And um, we met actually during my time at Penn State, we were both in the International Agriculture and Development um, dual title together. And so we're both really excited to talk with all of you about what we've learned about cocoa and chocolate, um, you know, in our working lives and in our graduate school lives. And so Alejandro and I talked and, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is such an overwhelming topic. We could spend months talking about <laughs> chocolate and cacao and everything. So we decided to just kind of keep it high level and talk about Theobroma cacao, this plant that we know and love and the journey that, you know, this tree to bean to bar to consumer that um, happens in the whole chocolate making process. So without further ado, I'll let Alejandro take it from here. Okay, thank you so much, Alison, and thanks for having me. Thanks for having us, for inviting us to join this cool presentation. And to be honest, like I'm really happy to talk not only about Theobroma cacao, the name of the tree from which chocolate is made, but also to talk a little bit more like about the farmers that make chocolate a reality. And what a better way to start this than by describing this amazing plant that you see here in your screens is Theobroma cacao, the scientific name, which name is derived from the Greek, like which means food of the gods. But in this presentation, I think that rather than referring to the tree as the food of the gods tree, uh, we will refer to it like as the cacao. And now some interesting facts, facts about this tree that you're seeing here, like the cacao tree is like an evergreen tree that grows in the humid tropics, 20 degrees north and south from the equator. And this is a long lived tree. It can live up to 100 years, you know, like I haven't witnessed that, like that's what I've read. And, but it can be cultivated for more than 40 years. That's actually like the, cultivated life of, of the tree. Uh, interestingly, the tree produces the flowers and the fruits that we call the pods. 
uh, on the trunk and in, on the main branches. So those red pots that you're seeing there like, are the fruits that contain the cocoa beans, which is in what we are like going to focus on uh, today. And naturally, the cacao could grow to a height of up to 15 meters. However, under cultivation, the tree are generally pruned to around three meters, which is probably the, the height of this tree that you're seeing here. Now I'm going to talk about like where is the cacao tree cultivated. Uh, so you can see here in this map that we are talking about roughly 5 million tons. Most of them, almost 80% of them produced in Africa, particularly in West Africa. The first larger producer country is the Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast. The second largest is Ghana. Then the third largest, and it just happened this year, is now Ecuador, before it was Indonesia. <clears throat> uh, but you can see here that like the Asia and in Ocean, Oceania is still like an important uh, cocoa, uh, cacao producer. Uh, important to mention, and you are seeing here like two different colors, like you can divide the cacao like in two uh, like big groups, like 95% of the cacao is considered bulk for which the Ivory Coast and Ghana are the main producer. And this fits like into the bulk chocolate supply chain that Alison is gonna talk later. And the other, the remaining 5% approximately, which are like is in, shown here in blue, the producer, the, the countries that produce a fine and flavored cacao, uh, which most like goes to the craft chocolate uh, supply chain. Now in the next slide, like uh, historically, the tree like the cacao has been divided in three main varieties, like the Criollo, Forastero, and Trinitarium. Like Criollo and Trinitarium and those that form like the fine and flavor cacao. But recent studies propose a new classification in which 10 groups uh, were like uh, created and the, those groups were named according to their geographic origin. And something interesting, like the origin of the species of Theobroma cacao is here in this area, in the basin of the Amazon River, like in Southern Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. And there is where you can see like the highest diversity, which is an indicator of where, uh, of where a species was originated. And <clears throat> interestingly, uh, plant genet geneticists like historians have identified that cacao like in, in Central America uh, was like uh, cultivated like around uh, 3,600 years ago. But recently a paper was published saying that in Southern Ecuador, they were cultivating cacao. It was domesticated around 5,300 uh, years ago, so which is pretty amazing. Now, like in the next slide, I'm gonna show you like how this great diversity of the cacao, like as a species, is expressed in the way you can see in the phenotype. So these are different varieties. They are all cultivated, but you can see like a good example of how cacao diversity is expressed in the colors of the pods. And the same is for the leaves, for the flowers, and for the seeds. You can see here like white seeds and the other are a little more purple seeds and it all changes also the flavor. So in the next slide, for instance, I'm, uh, I'm showing you like the pot diversity of like mainly uh, widely cultivated uh, variety of, of cacao. And you can see here the differences in colors, in shapes, but the difference is also in size, like in the texture, the number of beans per pot, like the size of the beans, and as I mentioned in the flavor, like the varieties and like the ones that determine, you know, like the big part, the flavor of, of the of the cocoa beans and at the end of the chocolate. Now in the next, next one, how is cacao cultivated? Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, this is a long leaf tree that it can be cultivated for more than four years, like, which is good from one point of view. You don't have to establish a new plan. You can like, like pretty much 
like work with one plan for your entire working life. However, it also takes a long time for one plan to get productive. And this is an issue for many farmers, which in the first three years of like the cacao cultivations will not perceive any income from the cacao. And under these circumstances, many farmers establish staple crops like banana, plantain, cassava, corn, tomato, beans, like during these in productive years. Uh, and another important thing is that it's important to know that the cacao tree like naturally evolved below the canopy of the forest. These big trees, cacao was not as big as tall, like and as tall as like the trees in the forest. Therefore, like in the regions with high radiation, which is most of the tropical regions where the tree is cultivated, the cacao trees establish in agroforestry systems. And I want you to get an idea of what an agroforestry system is. And this is a very short video and please look at it and hear like, So I don't know if you could hear that, but there were birds like birds like chirping and like it's like a forest. Uh, it's pretty amazing in Italy is explained because that's the like natural environment where cacao evolved and where photosynthesis is like optimized. So that's why, which is pretty cool. Like you can consider the agroforestry system of cacao as a carbon like fixation system. So it's pretty interesting. Now, very briefly, I'm gonna mention like some steps uh, of the cacao cultivation. It, it, it all starts in the nursery in some parts, in some countries, for instance, in Colombia, where I am from, most of the cacao is grafted in the nurseries. In other regions, like in Ecuador, they do not graft the cacao, they use uh, rooted cuttings. In Africa, for instance, they use seeds. Um, uh, next, please. <clears throat> there are other practices, as I mentioned, pruning is very important to keep like the, the height of the tree to a level that you can harvest the pots and so on. Fertilizing is very important. Uh, it is also in the next slide. Uh, the control of pests and diseases uh, right now is like one of the biggest factors that explain like low productivities and that is affecting 40%, 50% of the harvest that is getting lost because of these diseases. So farmers have to control in, in most of the cases just by removing the, the pots that are infected, those that you can see here. And also another practices are the, the next one, please. And harvest and fermentation, like it's key and fermentation plays a crucial role in producing flavor and harvest too. Like farmers mo in most of the countries harvest like with using these machete. Uh, then they have to like open the pot and take away all these white, like the beans that are surrounded by this white pulp, which is very sweet. It contains a lot of carbohydrates and that's the main resource for the fermentation, which as I mentioned, plays a crucial role in producing flavor. You can see the chemistry that is happening here, like the microbes involved here is amazing. And here's when the flavor, besides the, the variety that I just mentioned, where the flavor starts. And the next one, please. And Alejandro, I would just like to yeah. add too that harvest is typically happening twice a year, right? Yeah, like, and that's a great point. It depends on the region and it is like, like how often it occurs depends on the, the environmental condition and mainly on the rainfall. For instance, there are some regions in Colombia where there are two main like uh, periods of harvest like a year, but there are others when the like rainfall is pretty stable through the year, like they are harvesting cocoa, even though there are some peaks, they are harvesting cocoa all year round, but that's a, that's a great point. And I think I've heard too that with climate variability, also harvest is kind of variable too. That yeah, yeah, it absolutely. To be more dis defined, and now it's more random. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's still many things that we are we don't know like about cacao and about what explains, for instance, 
the cacao production pollination. We know that there are insects pollinating the, the flowers and then like it's around six months, five months later after a flower is pollinated that you get the pot. But that process of pollination is still unclear. We don't know how climate change impacts these insects that are pollinating or if the flower itself is affected due to changes in the like climate. So yeah, but it's pretty interesting and complex as well. Now, um, I mentioned fermentation is crucial like for producing flavor and it happens like in typically in wooden boxes. This is a photo from Allison from Honduras. Uh, it's the same in Colombia. However, there are other regions with the fermentation practices are different. It's interesting that even though this is a super complex process in which like we don't even know how many species the species of microorganism influencing the fermentation change according to the location. It's very complex, but it still is made like in a very simple way in these wooden boxes when you have like to um, like turn the beans like uh, usually every two days, it depends also on the region. And after our approximately six days of being fermented, the, the beans that now all these like white pulp disappear and it's now kind of like brownish then you, uh, farmers put those beans like to dry. In most of the countries, uh, dry like it's, it's sun drying the method for drying the beans. And you can see here like this interesting tray, like this uh, drying system. This is a short video too. Uh, so they are keeping like the like the. Um, the beans like safe during night on when it's raining. But there are also some regions where the, the farmers are in adopting artificial drying. It doesn't happen very frequent because the sun drying. Uh, this is another video too. This is more industrialized. But as I mentioned, most of the countries, sun drying is like the main way to uh, dry the cocoa beans. Now, um, I want to I wanna talk to you a little bit like more about who are the cacao farmers and where we are talking like globally, we are talking about five to six million small holders households. Uh, and by this, we are talking about 40 to 50 million people that depends on cocoa and cacao as a cash crop uh, around 70% of the cacao, like the cocoa is produced by these small holders. Uh, growing cacao is very like hard. It's a really hard work and cacao is primarily produced by hand. Like when I'm saying my hand, they are like done using like a lot of, it's not widely mechanized. And uh, it's very sad, but unfortunately most of these far small farmers face poverty issues including lack of access to land in some cases, education, the gap of the price like they are receiving is like big and, and like in many cases, like the social conditions are very hard for, for several farmers. And something important here and a clear message, while talking about the social context of the cacao sectors of the farmers, it is important to mention that the diversity of the farmers and its social condition is as diverse as the diversity of the cacao tree, like uh, the origin of the farmers, their cultures, their natural environments, like it's pretty diverse. And here I have like an example of three important like producer countries, the Cote d'Ivoire, Ecuador and Colombia. Uh, their origins like are diverse, like the numbers are diverse, um, like the several like like mentor culture. However, they have one thing in common and it's the low productivity. By saying this, I'm introducing the next slide in which I'll, I'm going to close like my part by talking like what I'm doing for my PhD. My PhD focuses on like the social component of the, of the cacao production. And uh, as you can see here, like there is like a, a big problem that I'm tackling that is that technical solutions to solve the problems that farmers are facing, they have been already developed. 
we already know that, that we can increase production. And previously, I didn't mention, but probably you saw productivity of around 500 kilograms per hectare per year. But we know that we can produce way more, three, four times that amount. And we know how. There are some farms that are producing that. The, the thing that explains that that level of productivity is not like widely uh, uh, so representing most of the farmers is because the adoption of agricultural technology, agricultural practices is low, and it's specifically in the country I'm working, which is Colombia. Uh, consequently, as I'm saying here, the low adoption of technology jeopardizes the effectiveness of efforts to increase farmer incomes. So please, in the next one, I'll briefly mention what I'm doing and what's my objective. My broad research question is why didn't farmers adopt technology? Uh, so like, to answer these questions, like I'm using a mixed method to study, and in which I'm using qualitative research first to develop a conceptual framework. Uh, this is where I am right now. This is a framework that I developed. All these factors that explain the adoption of technology in one specific region, it all depends on the region and the colors. You cannot read here, but the colors depends. If, for instance, like red colors is access to resources. The orange one is like, a subsidized innovation or the yellow one is their beliefs regarding the, the technology and so on. Um, but basically I'm trying to end this second part like it's a quantitative um, research in which I am like um, testing this hypothesis that this conceptual framework is proposing trying to understand which of those factors are significant on explaining the adoption of technology and identifying how could we in the future like uh, affect those factors to enhance like the adoption of technology. And finally, like I'm gonna mention very briefly what I did for my master's degrees, which I was here at Penn State. Uh, I did like the evaluation of a program. And the thing is that in Colombia, where I am from, like in where my research has been focused, like the number of cacao programs has, is increasing. The cacao has been considered as a peace crop. Like, however, despite many efforts, the sector is still underperformed it, its performance. And basically my master's, what I did is answer the question is, are cacao projects in Colombia successful? So that's another part that I did. So thank you so much. So now Alison is gonna continue this like uh, story like from the beans uh, to the chocolate bar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for um, bringing us from from tree to fermented and dried bean. And thank you too for mentioning the cacao farmers. Um, what I have here is. The, and, and as Alejandro mentioned as well, you know, there was that difference between bulk chocolate and, and maybe finer flavor um, cocoa. And so what I have here is this supply chain, which really kind of demonstrates the linkages between the, the farmers that Alejandro mentioned and all of these other steps that transform this dried bean into chocolate. So the farmer may, you know, directly sell this um, the cocoa beans to a local trader, or they may uh, do their fermentation and drying at a cooperative. And then from there, the dried cocoa beans are going to either domestic grinders, multinational grinders, um, or exporters who might be then the middlemen in between shipping the beans onto multinational grinders. And once, and I'll get into this a little bit more um, in the next slide, but once the cocoa is ground, which means it's um, been, let's see, uh, winnowed, roasted, and ground into cocoa liquor or cocoa mass, then it moves on typically to larger chocolate manufacturers or small chocolate manufacturers who then transform it into a chocolate bar, which then makes its way to a supermarket or a specialty store, and then ultimately on to us as consumers. So I did want to just kind of create that linkage between the tree, the farmer, you know, like kind of the, the bean itself, and then also the people and the um, manufacturing that goes along with this whole system. So I'm going to jump over that slide and just get right into cocoa grinding. So once the dried beans make it to 
the cocoa grinder. And, and I should mention too, like in that um, display, the grinders can be in country, in the origin country, or they can be in the global north. So classically, uh, as a result of colonization, right, the, the tree made its way from the Amazon throughout parts around the equator, and then, um, you know, set up trade routes that made sense with the colonizers at that time. And so classically, cocoa beans have been produced in the global south and then transported to the global north for, uh, you know, manufacture. Lately, and, and maybe the past 10 to 15 years, there has been more grinding happening in origin countries. And a big reason for that is, uh, you know, these origin countries have said, look, like we're losing a lot of money by this being sold as a commodity. And in order to make money on this, you know, giant part of our economy, we need to add the value here. So, so we're setting up grinders and therefore all of these large multinational grinders are setting up shop in the country. So you'll see in Cote d'Ivoire, Indonesia, Ghana, you'll see some of these big grinders like Barry Calibo, Olam, Cargill in country now. However, they're also still, um, the biggest grinding port is in Amsterdam. So that is still consistent with tradition. But now that we know where this is happening, I'll move forward. And, and I do wanna thank Blommer Chocolate for these really great graphics. Um, they, they're available online and, and Blommer has a wonderful graphic artist. So the beans either are shipped in burlap sacks, um, typically from the field or from the drying area to the grinding plant or factory. Um, first, the beans are cleaned. There tends to be you know, as you saw, you know, in our in our images, the beans were fermented and dried on in boxes and in trays. But sometimes there can be, you know, dirt that blows onto the trays. And in other parts of the world, in, in typically in West Africa, sometimes the beans are fermented and dried on the ground. So then you could get rocks or or other debris. So the first step is clean off the beans. And then in this demo we have roasting. So we could take that full whole bean and roast it. And this, as Alejandro explained, fermentation is important for the development of flavor precursors and chemical reactions that happen within the bean. But then those are played upon during roasting uh, in something called Maillard reactions, which some of the food science folks out there may be familiar with. So after roasting is the winnowing step. And in this step, you have a cracker that cracks these beans and the shells apart from one another. And then in this case, you have this blower here, let's see, uh, which would be blowing away the lighter um, parts, which would be the shells. And then the beans, which are now called nibs because they're broken beans, they continue along uh, the chain. So next is grinding. And this can happen in any manner of ways. You can use um, stones or a ball mill. Um, there's a lot of different ways to grind nibs into what happens next, which is cocoa liquor, which I mentioned before. And cocoa liquor is just like, it's the key ingredient to chocolate, right? So it's composed of 50% fat thereabouts, which we call cocoa butter, and then 50% of cocoa solids, which are the things that make it dark brown. And cocoa liquor can make its way onto a chocolate factory, and I'll get into that later, or another big part of what happens at cocoa grinders is oh, uh, transforming this liquor into cocoa powder and cocoa butter. And so this happens in a gigantic hydraulic press uh, that's typically like the, like just enormous, maybe three or four meters long. And it's a purely physical process. So there's no chemicals added. And what you do is you take the liquor and you squish it. And then what happens is, is what drains out the bottom is cocoa butter. And what you're left with is a bunch of cocoa powder cakes that are stuck in this press. So then the cakes are, they're tight. They're so tightly smushed together that they have to get ground up again. And so they're milled and then they get packaged into sacks as cocoa powder. Now, conversely, if you wanted to take that cocoa liquor and make chocolate, 
you would do something like this. So you would take the chocolate liquor and you would add cocoa butter and you, and I guess what I'll say is cocoa butter is optional. To make baseline chocolate, what you need is cocoa liquor and sugar, right? Unless you have a 100% cocoa chocolate bar, then you would have just 100% cocoa liquor. But in this case, we'll do cocoa liquor, we'll add some cocoa butter, we'll make milk chocolate and add milk powder. And we could also add an extra bit of cocoa powder if we wanted to increase the cocoa level in this particular chocolate. The next step that happens is this mixture, which kind of looks like wet sand, goes through a refiner process. And this five roll refiner is another gigantic piece of equipment that's about two meters wide. And it's five rolls and you put this wet sandy paste on it. And at the top, sugar is just normal granulated sugar. And by the time it gets to the bottom, the sugar is about 25 microns in size. And that's what makes chocolate so wonderful when we eat it is that it just melts on our mouth, mostly because we can't differentiate the particle sizes. So once we have decreased the particle size, the next step is a big mixing step, which is called conching. And traditionally <clears throat> a conch looked like the inside of a conch shell. And so there would be these longitudinal conches that would um, rub together. And typically they were granite, I think. Uh, but now the more modern style is kind of like a big mixer, kind of like your KitchenAid, but again, more gigantic, higher energy input, uh, more friction. And the goal here is really to just take all those sugar particles that we decreased in size and then coat them with all of the fats that we added before. So the cocoa butter, and, and maybe there's some milk fat that we added. So we're really just coating and mixing. And the other thing too, traditionally, that the conscious thought to do is to kind of blow off some of the volatile chemicals that are traditionally in the chocolate liquor, um, the cocoa butter, or the milk. So really kind of evening out that flavor. So what is that chocolate, for example, Blommer is, um, they, are a business to business operation. So they're making a lot of chocolate for other folks. So in their um, situation, they're typically shipping out liquid chocolate. So if you ever see a tanker truck on the road that says Blommer on the side, like there's probably molten chocolate or cocoa liquor inside, which is pretty cool to think about. Um, conversely, if they were going to make chocolate at their facility, the next step would be to take this molten chocolate, temper it, and tempering is a process of kind of selecting for the most ideal um, crystal formation of the cocoa butter fat. So this is typically beta prime, and you do that by raising the temperature of the chocolate, kind of destroying all of the crystal memory, and then going to a specific temperature based upon what kind of um, chocolate you're making, milk or dark, and that selects for the correct um, crystal formation. So from there, you would either mold the chocolate. So you put it in like a giant, in this case, these are 10 pound bars, so they're gigantic <laughs> shapes, or maybe you would do a smaller shape like a Hershey bar shape, and you would pour it into that and then cool it off. And then once it's cool, you would pack it up and ship it out. Alternatively, this is drop depositing, which is also kind of how the Hershey Kisses are made, where you have this vat of chocolate and it kind of deposits little amounts onto the conveyor belt as it goes by. And that's how you create that morsel shape. So I think we're kind of running low on time. Um, I'll briefly try to touch on a little bit of my research um, and then we'll have some time for questions. So during my PhD, something that we isolated that we thought was really interesting and kind of emerging <clears throat> is this idea of craft chocolate. So what we've kind of taken you through is, you know, and, and what you saw in that initial map is bulk cacao that becomes bulk chocolate. And this is kind of on this grand scale. In 1995, this company called Scharfenberger 
uh, was created by two guys out in Berkeley and they wanted to make chocolate in their garage and they did that successfully. And then kind of craft chocolate blew up and, and I'll get into that in the next slide, but briefly, the definition that I used throughout my dissertation work was that craft chocolate is from a company that was established during this recent wave of innovation since 1997. They start with cocoa beans and then produce finished chocolate or bean to bar kind of under one roof. And these chocolates aren't owned by one of the big five multinational chocolate companies like Nestle, Mondelez, Hershey, Mars, or Ferrero Rocher. And as you can see here, I mean, in 1995, there were like a few companies. And then as of 2021, there were almost 500. So when I modeled this, it was exponential growth. And, and so that was really interesting to, to bear in mind um, throughout my research. Two I'll touch upon here, you know, what I, what we kind of isolated in this craft chocolate world is, is not only those kind of three main points, but also that it tended to be a smaller, shorter supply chain. So they kind of kicked out the grinders, right, by, you know, processing the bean in-house. And then they were typically selling directly to consumers in-house or to small um, specialty outlets. So a bit of a different supply chain here. And I just wanna to touch very briefly on uh, a research study that I did because we, we were looking at this and observing this trend and we're like, okay, but what's going on here? Like, are people eating this? Do consumers care about craft chocolate? You know, what's going on here? And so with this work, what I did is I wanted to gain insight into American premium chocolate consumer perception of craft chocolate, and then identify different attributes that would be important to these consumers. So to do this, I screened for premium chocolate consumers, and then I did four focus groups, which were separated by gender. As part of the work, I did a projective mapping activity on perceived quality of chocolates, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then during the focus groups, we ate through five different chocolates. So we did a mainstream chocolate. We did three premium chocolates with different kind of logos and um, claims and affiliations. And then finally, a craft chocolate, which was the standalone chocolate bar. So the projective mapping activity looked like this. Um, before the focus groups, I gave my participants sheets of paper and 47 stickers. And I said, please take these stickers and arrange them on this 11 by 17 inch white piece of paper in terms of similarities and dissimilarities in quality. And so what I got back were 27 of these. Uh, <laughs> and you're like, okay, now what do we do? Well, very cool. Um, we took, we established an X and Y axis and then create or measured rather distance from that axis of every single product and then word data that was associated with those products. And then I was able to run a multiple factor analysis and create a kind of composite product map. With focus groups, uh, we recorded all of the audio, transcribed all of the audio um, into all of these little <laughs> uh, texts and quotes. And then I sifted through um, all of the quotes and tried to understand kind of what was going on using a method called grounded theory. And so, and actually I should mention too, this is a very classical way to do <laughs> grounded theory and, and analyze qualitative data, which is a scissor and sort technique. Whereas, um, you know, other folks who do qualitative data with more frequency, they're familiar with computer software to do this, but it was my first time. So I was like, let's do this the old fashioned way. And what was cool is through looking at and reading through all the quotes, you kind of create different codes. And then once you have all these codes, you kind of subsume the codes into themes. And so that's what I use to uh, kind of make sense of my focus groups and then also present the data to all of you. So let's get right into the results. Um, the first thing I wanna discuss is just that with craft chocolate, I think the biggest finding was that 
it was novel. And so this one of the consumers said, wow, that must be good. I don't even recognize it. So it was very interesting, but craft chocolate was novel. They didn't really know what it was. They assumed it was high quality and delicious and expensive, um, but couldn't really you know, pinpoint where it belonged in, in the scheme of chocolate. And from my other work, what, we, what I established is that there were kind of three main attributes that were desirable in chocolate products. So search attributes, credence attributes, and experience attributes. And these different attributes aligned with a lot of the work that's been done on consumers in the past. Um, search attributes being those that you can kind of see when you're looking for a product. Credence attributes being those that the consumer impresses upon the product. And then experience attributes, which are, you know, what you experience while you are consuming or purchasing the product. So some of the search attributes were highlighted really clearly here. And this is, this is my projective map. And this is kind of that composite of all of the projective maps that were returned by my consumers during the focus groups. And I think one of the clearest things was just that consumers really segmented based on a lot of those search attributes, right? Which makes sense because they weren't able to eat them. They were just able to look at the stick stickers and then sort them around. So I think one thing I like to highlight is that here in the bottom right, we have cheap, available, candy, and American. Over here on the left is specialty, artisan, uh, fair trade organic flavor. And then up here we have special occasion and individually wrapped. Excuse me. So of all the products that we gave them, the 47 stickers, they kind of presented themselves in these three main segments, right? So like candy. And then interestingly, the premium and the craft were both segmented together here, whereas up here is kind of these special occasion and gifting chocolate. So to continue with a couple of more um, search attributes, in terms of segmentation, right? Here's a quote from one of my consumers that I cherish. Uh, Over here is grandma's chocolates, the Whitman sampler. You go to old folks and this is what they buy. And then another search attribute that emerged as being very important was packaging. And these consumers were very into gold and gold foil wrapped around the bar and gold on the package itself. And this consumer said, the gold packaging with the gold foil, it's like a Willy Wonka moment. I don't know, it's just really special. So one of the main credence attributes was meaning. And this came up uh, in terms of kind of, you know, what meaning do you put on this bar? And what does this bar say about you? And in this case with the endangered species chocolate, which was one of our premium chocolate bars, 10% of proceeds benefit um, endangered species. And so this consumer said, look, you know, it's the donation portion that drives this for me. Um, I don't really care about organic, gluten-free, but I'm buying this chocolate bar and I'm doing something and it makes me feel good. So finally, in terms of experience attributes, one that I found particularly interesting was treat myself. And we had a consumer say, look, there's a chocolatier in Philadelphia, John and Kira's lovely chocolates. They're about five or $6 a piece. And a 50 pound box of chocolates from John and Kira's may last me six months because I just won't sit and eat. I'm just gonna treat myself tonight and I'm gonna have a piece of that chocolate. And so in the way that consumers, you know, experience attributes, and then this was kind of a mixture of utility and joy, right? Like they may buy this box of chocolate for someone else. And in that regard, it's a gift and, and there's the utility of it. But in this case, this consumer said, look, I'm going to experience joy from this chocolate like intentionally. So just to wrap up, my consumer research takeaways were that um, craft chocolate is novel and consumers didn't really know how to categorize it and what to do with it. Or as you saw in the projective map, they categorized it with premium. They also segmented the chocolate in a unique way, which is actually different from the National Confectioners Association, and really focus on usage occasion rather than cost or price. 
Um, ultimately, the attributes that I found to be important were search attributes, credence attributes, and experience attributes. So uh, what Alejandro and I would really like for you all to take away from our presentation is that Theobroma cacao is an evergreen tree native to the humid tropics. It's cultivated within 20 degrees of the equator. Um, subject to change though, I would say due to climate variation, but the largest producer is Africa and then Oceania and then the Americas, which I guess, honestly, right now, maybe the Americas are edging out Oceania, but it's, it's a close call. And Theobroma cacao is typically grown in an agroforestry system. I think it's also important to note that cacao is cultivated, fermented and dried by about 6 million smallholder households in the global south. Uh, those dried, well, those fermented and dried cocoa beans are then, in terms of processing, ground into cocoa liquor after roasting and winnowing, and then, if desired, maybe cocoa powder and cocoa butter. One other thing to note is that bulk is, um, you know, kind of on this grander scale that's mainly uh, consumed in the global north, and the cocoa ingredients are combined and processed into chocolate. And I think the other thing that we'd like you to take away is that craft chocolate is typically manufactured from bean to bar under one roof. So we have some, I know that this is recorded. And so if you wanted to check into some things later on, um, there's a couple of resources. So here I've, I've given a few podcast interviews and uh, my consumer research is also published in plus one, which is open access. So feel free to dig deeper into that. And uh, these are some of Alejandro and I's favorite books that we've um, selected for you. Also, uh, during our time at Penn State, and actually now that I'm at Hershey, I'm still involved in the Cacao and Chocolate Research Network of Penn State, which pulls together a lot of folks throughout the university who study cacao and chocolate and cocoa from you know, the full spectrum of disciplines. So there's anthropologists, food scientists, rural sociologists, et cetera. And also I know I wasn't able to get into kind of the, the video aspect of cacao and chocolate, but um, I did wanna leave you all with uh, some uh, It's Alive videos from Brad Leon at Bon Appetit. So feel free to click on those YouTube videos because they're pretty funny and entertaining. So I think that's all um, for me. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add Alejandro. No, I think it was great, great job, yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was so interesting. I'm definitely going to have to check out some of these extra resources. Um, yeah, it's interesting. When I was living in Boston, some of my friends and I did a tour of the, the Taza chocolate, chocolate facility, and we did some tasting. And I remember, I have a distinct memory of being like, wow, this texture is very different from what I think of as being like characteristic of chocolate. But like, I don't know anything about food. So it must just be like really, really high quality. And I must just not know what's going on. So it's so interesting that it sounds like I'm not, I'm not alone in those feelings. Um, so now we'll open it up to some questions. So um, if you have questions, you can either put them in the Q and A and we'll read them out and answer them that way. Or you can raise your hand and then I'll, I'll like allow you to talk that way if you wanna ask the question yourself. Um, so first, it looks like we have a question from Tara. Um, so I think this was during the chocolate making part. She wonders, what's the smallest particle size that can be discerned? Ooh, Tara, great question. Uh, actually, Scott Breen, who was um, in my cohort in our food science department, actually dug into this in a really cool way. And uh, he published his work in scientific reports. So that's uh, open access as well. So Definitely everyone check it out. Um, this is hotly debated. Uh, <laughs> it's really because the lore in the industry is that you can't feel anything, um, I think lower than 18 micron or something. But what Scott did is he took these, he collaborated with another researcher and he took these von Freiherr probes and they were different sized, like really skinny, metal probes that I actually participated in the study and he like touched on my tongue 
And I had to like close my eyes and raise my hand if I could feel it or not feel it. Um, so this is still hotly debated, but I would say about 20-ish micron. And, and I think as far as chocolate goes, um, once you try to get lower than that, you end up having just too many small particles and the chocolate stops flowing very well, unless you add a ton of fat to encourage it to flow. So there are, there's more kind of processing and technical restrictions um, as well. But yeah, I, I, and I think too, chocolate companies are like, well, we're not gonna refine it any lower than people can feel it because why bother? Like, um, but I would say have a Lent bar, have a Hershey bar side by side, see if you can feel particles. I think that's a good test. Awesome, it looks like we also have a question from Sam. So Sam, you should be able to talk now. I don't know, Sam, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I'm not sure if others are able to hear you better. I think it might be better to type it out if possible. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Definitely check it out. It's Nixon, who's uh, who's talking to us. Okay, so we have a question for Alejandro. All right, so we have, I read uh, some of the work that Tara did regarding why people don't take new advantages in technology and cacao. Um, so what do you think about it? I'm oh, sorry, Tammy. <laughs> uh, so what would you have thoughts on that? Yeah, like, so Lena is another Colombian like friend who did her master's in a similar topic that I did. So I think that's a great question and like, I would say like technology, the adoption of technology, it's like a complicated phenomenon happening, happening like all like all over the world with all like every available technology. So for instance, there is like this book like that talks like why do we use this type of keyboard, the Q-W-E-R-T instead of like the Devorak, which is way faster. We still like, like I keep using this one. So there are like, and it has its own explanation. And like the, the short answer to your question is like, it all depends. Like in the case of Lena's situation, she focuses on one region where they have like a very short story with cacao. Cacao was introduced very like recently to the region where she did her study and they didn't have the culture. So they had like a culture with avocado trees and they had some preferences, like in this case, in that particular region, preferences was an important factor to like understand why do you adopt technologies in the cacao instead of putting that time like to another thing. And they were putting their time to the, like cultivating the avocado tree instead of like pruning the cacao or fertilizing the cacao because they didn't feel that attached. 
but he also did interesting like uh, he found like for instance like the price of the cocoa which makes sense the cheaper the cacao is like the lower like you're gonna adopt you know like technology uh, for the cacao you put that energy and time and money in other crops but what i have found in the region i'm working which is like a completely different region it has a cacao culture like it has been growing cacao for like decades uh, the factors are totally different uh, so, for instance, one of the factors that explains what, why farmers are like adopting these high yield cacao varieties is like the subsidies we are receiving. Uh, most of the farmers say like, okay, I did it because at some point someone gave me that. Uh, or because like some of them are do not adopting because their beliefs, they think that the hybrids, which is the, like the alternative innovation instead of like the new varieties are better so yeah it's it's pretty complicated and i think it all depends on the region and it also depends on what innovation are you talking about looks like sam yeah yeah go for it yeah and and, and basically and what you're saying is like it's completely true like we are the universities are constantly producing the solution to problems we call those innovations and most of the times those innovations do not get adopted and basically there are frameworks that explain why is that happening and i could summarize them the first one is like the relative advantage that someone perceived if the like consumers do not per, do not perceive like an advantage of adopting that innovation, they are not going to adopt it. There are other ones, for instance, compatibility. Uh, there are some regions where the innovation is not compatible with their beliefs systems, so that's a that's an important one. Uh, the like simplicity, how comp like if it is too complex, the, like the higher the degree of complexity, the lower the chance that it's getting adopted. Um, yeah, but just to mention a few. Yeah. And I'm focusing like on the largest cocoa producer region, which is like Santander is where I am right now. Uh, yes, Kim, this is the photo. I took this photo from this municipality. It's the cacao capital of Colombia. It's called San Vicente de Chupuri. So produces like uh, the first like Colombian producer. And yeah, that's where I'm doing my, my research right now. Very cool. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Alejandro, you have been investigating like Cote d'Ivoire a little bit too. Just, um, you know, some of the, some of the issues mm -hmm. going on in Cote d'Ivoire. And I was wondering just to piggyback on what Nixon asked, you know, are there really clear differences that you see in, in yes. the situation in Colombia versus Cote d'Ivoire? Because I, yeah. I think yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's and, and it's really interesting. For instance, right now, Cote d'Ivoire has been recognized as one of the largest like deforestation like countries because of cacao. And like that, that explains a lot what is going on with the practices they are adopting. First, like because of their social condition, most of the farmers from Cote d'Ivoire are from Burkina Faso. So immigration is key to understand why farmers are doing the things. The other thing is that like the, the way the farmers are doing the arrangement with the landowners and land ownership is not as it is here. Like uh, it has customary land, it's a customary land system when lands belongs to, to a tribe and things like that. So uh, clearing the forest, uh, like it's like a way to mark like the kind of like the land and so on. And, uh, yeah, there, there are no controls. So for instance, in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, right now, the, that big issue of deforestation is explained besides like the immigration issues that, that I just mentioned, because that land tenure system, which is not happening in Colombia. And they are saying, okay, it's a way to like, say this is mine and I have like the rights over this uh, region. And there are several explanations that, for instance, the, like the forest rent that when you clear the forest, like all the nutrients are there and the cacao tree that you plant, it's gonna grow very 
nicely and it's going to produce very well. Uh, but after 30 years, like you need to re replenish those nutrients. So perhaps that, that situation is what explaining why farmers are adopting fertilizers and why the farmers are planting on their just clear forests are not adopting fertilizers. Thank you, that's super interesting. Um, so it looks like we're right at that time. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, now's the time to ask, <laughs> speak now. Um, otherwise, I think we'll wrap up and thank you. Thank you both so much. This was so interesting. I feel like I learned so much. I feel like before meeting well, Allison, my, my understanding of chocolate was a little bit skewed from like Willy Wonka. So, <laughs> so this has definitely been very informative for me. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining. This is thank a, you so much for inviting us. Yeah. This was yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I will get this recording out for anyone also who wasn't able to attend and wants to, wants to see, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Right, thank care. you. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.